Biblical faith is an expression of love for God, not of greed. It originates from an eager desire to please God and to bring glory to Him, not a desire to exploit Him and exalt ourselves. Biblical faith advances God's purposes, not our own. And this faith gives the ability to endure times of poverty as well as times of having more than enough. Biblical faith rests on the fact that not only is the God of the Bible good, kind, caring, forgiving, generous, dependable, wise, powerful, and honest, He is completely superior to us in every way. Because of his infinite intelligence, wisdom, and goodness, God is always right. And because of his unending love and selflessness, he loves us more than we could ever love ourselves and always has what's best for us in his focus. If you truly know and believe the truth about God, you would always want God to have his perfect will for us and never push your own desires over the choices of God. So if we truly do know him, we aren't trying to push what we want on him. God does make promises that apply to all, saved and unsaved. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. That is one of them. But however, there are many promises that according to context are for followers of Jesus only. Those who have received Jesus as Savior are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. We're told that when we ask for anything according to God's will, He hears and gives us what we ask for. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And there are many other promises for believers concerning prayer. There are many times where God does not answer the prayers of an, of an unbeliever, but in his grace and mercy, he can and will intervene in the lives of unbelievers in their response to prayers because God is all about love. 1 John 4, 7 and 8 says, Love is of God and everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. He who doesn't love doesn't know God for God is love. 1 John 4, 16, He who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. Matthew 22, 36 through 40 says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second likewise is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. This verse is not telling us how to manipulate God to get our own way, but this is exactly how many see that verse. They are greedy for power, fame, luxury, comfort, sex, chemical highs, and they twist this verse to mean they will get the desires of their own heart. Infinite love means that God is completely unselfish, and as the cross of Christ clearly shows, Jesus, Jesus is always seeking the well-being of others and never his own comfort. Is God always focused on inspiring us to change our hearts for the better? Yes, but not getting us to change or corrupt his own heart. That verse is not saying that if you desire something, the way to get it is to delight in God. Delighting in God will profoundly impact your desires, and the longer you delight in him, your desires change. That's what that means. God will give you the desires of your heart, which will be very different by that point. To delight in God is to take our eyes off of ourself and to lose ourself in who God is. Anyone delighting in God loves him so much they would never knowingly ask for anything that grieves or hurts the heart of God. You would be so passionate about God that pleasing him means more to you than life or anything else you could ever desire. Jesus is a picture of this when in the garden, with sweat dripping from him like blood, he prayed, Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That was a prayer that, of Jesus that God did not answer. So prayer to God must be all about love first, 
our love for God, wanting to know him better, to be more like him, to please him, to bring honor to him and to see his will done. Prayer should be God-centered, not self-centered. Trying to make it God-centered in an attempt to manipulate God into giving you what you crave is a selfish attempt to exploit the goodness of God. And God can see all manipulation and he will expose all manipulation. Prayer should be about companionship, intimacy, and surrender. If it's all about me or about continually getting rather than giving, that is a perversion of what prayer should be. To claim Bible promises for self that were divinely given to people who were completely devoted to Jesus is fraudulent. It's not only taking Bible promises out of context, it's tearing them from Christianity and putting them into a false religion similar to voodoo or witchcraft. So trying to use faith and prayer to get our own way at the expense of God's best can become witchcraft. It angers God. James 4.4 4 says, Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. 1 John 2, 15 through 16 says, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, does not come from the Father, but from the world. 1 Timothy 5, 6 says, But she who gives herself to pleasure is dead while she lives. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, But mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days, People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. That's what the Bible says. So unless God is first in our lives and our affections, he's not our God. He has to be first in both of those things. Otherwise, it's completely deceptive to say he's your God. Life is not about self-indulgence or our comfort. It is about loving and delighting in God by giving all, A-L-L, -L, to the one who gave all for us. If we are unwilling to sacrifice for God everything else, including pursuit of romance, children, reputation, career, material things, financial security, what we think our pet sins, our country, our lives, or any other thing, anything that we hold closer than God, means God is not our God, that is. Unless we deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow Jesus who sweated blood, agonizing over what he was about to suffer, unless we're like the apostles preferring to be tortured to death rather than to deny Jesus, we deceive ourselves if we think we are a real Christian. We must love even our enemies, but the intensity of our love for God has to be that has to be first. Our determination to make him our master has to be there. It must be far above our love for anything else. God must have no competition in our lives, whether it be material things, pleasure, comfort, status, or the love of another person. He must be first or you have left him or you never knew him. God is love. He longs for intimacy with us. Religion has the potential to distract us from this. Many people who feel that they are followers of Christ are actually distracted by religion. We can become self-obsessed, infatuated with our faith rather than loving God. We have all kinds of Bible studies. We go to conferences, go to concerts, do all of these things, but there's no intimacy with God. We'd rather receive things rather than have companionship with God. We can end up seeing God as a means to our wants rather than a loving God and enjoying time with him. The God of our own creation might always be predictable. We tend to have control of the one that we create. The real God, however, remains infinitely superior to us. There's nothing erratic about him, but we, must un we have to understand he's a complete mystery. Like Jesus agonizing with God in the garden, faith is submitting to God. It is saying, your will be done, not mine. Determined to settle for God's best, never an attempt to get your own way at the expense of God's best. We were talking about the precarious times that we're living in and what to do about that. 
we all have an assignment from God if we're a genuine follower of his. We don't have to sit and think about, do I go build a bunker somewhere? Do I, do I go to this different state and live with people who have one? God has already assigned us to something if we belong to him because this is the moment for the church to rise up. So we don't have to make those decisions when we are intimate with God. He's already made them. We just need to listen. Our life is not our own when we're truly a follower of Jesus. It's not up to us to make those decisions. God does. Even Moses, David, Elijah, Job, Jonah, and all of Jesus' hand-picked disciples, including Peter, James, and John, all suffered from unanswered prayer. And despite all the Bible's promises about answered prayer, these men made requests of God that were never granted. We foolishly crave what will end up endangering us and resort to many dangerous tactics to coerce and pressure God into relenting and giving us what we want. We may even think that God is cruel or unjust and start developing judgments against God because we're not getting what we want. We ignore one verse and grab onto another because the answer is no and it's unacceptable. We don't want no. We want something and we're going to keep banging on his door until we get it. All that matters to us is getting our own foolish way. Many people who call themselves Christians are not even nice people. To be judgmental, to look down on anyone is condemned for a Christian. And we must run from this terrible offense to God. If not, we will end up like the enemies of Jesus who honored God with their mouths, but dishonored him with their lives. Their stuck up arrogance may have fooled some, but it made them themselves so blind, they killed Jesus, the Lord of glory. They killed him. They didn't even know he was God. To be critical, judgmental, moody, self-centered, controlling, manipulative, or lazy is unacceptable for any relationship and definitely unacceptable for a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a missionary for the devil if this is how you use your abilities to have emotions and you're hurting the efforts of the kingdom here on earth. Biblical faith has nothing to do with greed or viewing God as a vending machine. It is letting love abound and seeing and treating God and others as priceless. It is trusting God so much that we surrender to his glorious will, never to coerce him into things that might oppose his perfect will for us. It is not about fighting him to get our own way. It's about joining him in fighting everything that opposes him in ourselves and in the world. Faith is not tagging, if it be thy will, onto a prayer either. As if we have no idea whether God is wise, good, or devoted to our well-being, or we're just too lazy to find out what his will is on a specific matter. Biblical faith doesn't presume we are as smart as God and can guess what he's saying without listening. We desperately need a God whose goodness cannot be corrupted by Pharisees, manipulated by self-seekers, defiled by human greed, and whose wisdom will not be altered by those with brilliant deception who think that they've got one up on God. The universe needs a God who alone is worthy to receive glory and honor and power and has not signed away his right to rule the heavens and the earth to someone who can name it and claim it and grab his power from him. We pridefully presume we can rival God who is incapable of error but having the intelligence to always know how to bring about the best long-term outcome and the best thing for which to pray for that outcome. As the Bible uses the term, faith is not about manipulating God to get what we want. It involves trusting God enough to submit to his wisdom. James 4, 2 through 3 says, you want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. The Christian life is about dying to self and pleasures. This statement is not defeat or resigning ourselves to never getting our heart's desire, but of delighting in the perfect will of God and putting more faith in him than in ourselves when it comes to knowing what is best for our lives. There's a big difference between faith and presumption. Presumption is about verse grabbing and claiming it as a promise for ourselves without first seeking God's heart on the specific situation that we're facing. 
In fact, unless we take seriously the importance of not falsely claiming God has promised us something, we could anger him. Not even Jesus had the spiritual authority to take random verses to stand for faith. Even though the specific verse seemed appropriate for Jesus to apply to himself, not even the eternal Son of God could name it and claim it and remain undefiled. Psalms describes the consequences of putting God to this test. Psalm 78, 18, 21, and 31, they willfully put God to the test by demanding the food they craved. When the Lord heard them, he was very angry. His fire broke out against Jacob and his wrath rose against Israel. He put to death the sturdiest among them, cutting down the young men of Israel. The book of Numbers says it this way, Numbers 11:33. But while the meat was still between their teeth and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people and he struck them with a severe plague. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10:9. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. Whatever way you look at it, putting God to the test is a very serious offense. And this was what Jesus replied to Satan in the desert when he was given a chance to use the word. And he was even given a suggested verse to use. Jesus wouldn't even do it. He wouldn't demand on a verse to get a miracle that he needed. Would Christians be given a license to do the very thing that Jesus himself refused to do? Or somehow believe that we have immunity from the serious consequences of committing that great mistake of testing God with the word? James 4, 6 through 7, but he gives us more grace. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is a pretty famous verse. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Though applicable to other situations, this verse is actually referring to resisting the temptation to envy in verse 5 and to overcoming the temptation to pray with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures, verse 3. Few realize that this famous quote is referring to resisting the devil's enticement to use prayer to try to manipulate God into giving us things that end up not being in our best interest spiritually. The attraction of this devilish practice, such as witchcraft, which it is, is that they seem to offer supernatural help in feeding selfish desires when these things are suggested. The devil makes sure to not show us God's reluctance to give us things that are going to end up hurting us and enslaving us to bondage. In prayer ministry, I, I hardly can think of one where we have not run into a witchcraft devil. In almost every person, we're going to have one of those jump out. And this includes those who are part of ministries, who think that they're good Christians. We still face off with a witchcraft devil many times. We're in danger of degrading God by worshiping him as a source of what we desire instead of honoring him as the Holy One whose passion is righteousness and selfishness. The danger, the greatest danger, is to worship God as a source of what you desire. That is incredibly offensive to God. Too many of us break God's heart by putting him in a no-win situation. If God lovingly refuses to indulge our greed or our desires, we resent him. We turn away from him. We're angry with him. He didn't give us what we wanted, so now this doesn't work. This Christian thing didn't work for me. I'm going to go back out to the world, find something that makes me feel good there. If he gives us what we fight for, we destroy ourselves. Not only by that thing, but becoming infatuated with the temporary rather than the eternal. God is generous. He longs to give his gifts to us, but our sinfulness and spiritual immaturity often prevent him from being able to do that. Even if we could be trusted with wealth, those we seek to bring to Jesus can see what we have. They could be fooled into thinking they're heading for an eternity in heaven when they're not saved at all, and they only came to God because they were told of the gain it would bring to their life that material things would come their way, that they would have more money if they gave this specific amount of money, it will times a hundred. 
There's so many different ways that people are deceived by people who will have a severe price to pay in the end for having done that. Jesus kept warning would-be followers to count the cost, but today's tragedy is that many Christian leaders have abandoned Jesus' method because lowering the price of following Jesus increases church membership and what comes in the offering bucket. So if you say what Jesus actually said to cause people to know the truth about him and walk with Jesus the way that is required for heaven, your church crowd will thin down and you won't get as much money. So that's why they cheapen Jesus. But that price is not theirs to lower. They have sold their souls to temporary fame and fortune and much worse, they have seduced others into following them to spiritual ruin and hell for eternity. The only hope is that they repent and see their error and let people know that they were in error and preach the truth about Jesus Christ. The very worst of all crimes is to let people feel sure of their salvation when they are not in a spiritual covenant with the Holy One. They are headed for endless torment without the slightest clue they even need to be saved. Confident and ignorant of eternal hell that's waiting for them, they've been conned into building their house on sand by all the false prophets in the ministry. I would say over half the people that come to me asking for help, wanting deliverance, have no issue with their salvation. They are absolutely certain of their salvation. And when you start breaking down what's going on in their life, many of them are sexually immoral. They're, they're definitely not following Jesus. They have all kinds of deal breakers in their own confession that aren't even getting flagged in their mind. And nothing is flagging them. The Bible is clear that most of the things they mention are not present in a true follower of Jesus, and they don't even know that. And then when I try to tell them this, they think I'm rigid, that I am some different kind of fanatic person, but I'm just going by what the Bible says. Well, sadly, on Judgment Day, that's what the standard is going to be. And those who led everyone astray will suffer the consequence of doing that. They will miss everything also. I don't want to be one of those people because I nearly went to hell and I had talked to many people, many pastors by then trying to find a way to go to heaven and all of them told me not to worry. They told me to go to detox. Get sober, honey. We'll come and help you there. They didn't know I wasn't going to live long enough to get to detox. People aren't telling people where they're going to end up if they do not turn from their sin and follow Jesus. Shepherds are not telling people. Hardly anyone is telling people that to be a follower of Jesus is required to go to heaven for eternity. And a follower of Jesus follows Jesus, not in word, but in action. You do not sin and offend God on purpose. James 4, 13 through 16 says, Come now, you who say today or tomorrow, let's go into this city and spend a year there, trade and make a profit, whereas you don't know what your life will be like for tomorrow. For what is your life? For you are a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. For you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will both live and do this or that. But now you glory in your boasting. All such boasting is evil. God's pampering of us may we may think that would do wonders in the short term, but it would actually stifle our faith. What would seem like building faith would actually be building a dependency on circumstances and feelings, not building faith in the love and integrity of God. Faith is not about thinking that God is some kind of a dealer out there, but thinking of him as the passionate, tender-hearted one that he truly is. Faith is about believing in the love and goodness and dependability and wisdom of our glorious Savior, no matter what comes our way. And a lot of times, what comes our way is heartbreak. 
but it cannot sway how we see God. God himself suffered heartbreak. He's not going to exempt us. True faith comes not from being catered to, but from having a hold on when all the outward signs keep screaming that God must be selfish, cheap, uncaring, not looking. True faith holds on. You aren't swayed by that. You aren't swayed when Job's wife said to him, curse God and die after all the things that happened to them. Job says, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. That's the kind of faith we need. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, All who desire to live godly in Jesus Christ will suffer persecution. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. That's all. And many of us, we can tolerate and understand unanswered prayer, but when it turns different and personal tragedy strikes our life, that becomes a different thing. Great faith does not mean an end to dark times when everything and everyone in hell, heaven, and earth seems to be against you. Great faith means plowing on in the dark, stubbornly holding on to the conviction that nothing, not oppression or anguish or persecution or famine, nor nakedness or peril or sword, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor debt, depth, nor any created thing. Romans 8, 35 through 39, nor any unanswered prayer can mean that God has stopped loving you or has given up on you. H. A. A. Kennedy wrote, the prospect of suffering was apt to terrify them, but when they view suffering in its true light, they will discover it is a gift of God's grace instead of, of an evil. To emphasize the real value of suffering for Christ's sake, he compares it with that which we all acknowledge as the crowning blessing of their lives, their faith in him. First Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, don't be astonished at the fiery trial which has come upon you to test you as though a strange thing happened to you. First Peter 3.17 says, For it is better if it is God's will that you suffer for doing well than for doing evil. The Bible regards it a privilege for the righteous to suffer, a privilege. Like Jesus in the garden, this involves having prayers for deliverance from suffering go unanswered. Such suffering certainly includes persecution. The Bible says, blessed are you when people reproach you, persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. But it's more than that. When Jesus' followers suffer, it is because rather than taking it easy in heaven, they have been assigned to a spiritual war zone here on earth. And this is our opportunity for glory. We should not waste this experience and let it be used to, be, to achieve the most for God. We should be always seeking to further the kingdom of God here. Otherwise, if you are not furthering that kingdom, you're furthering the other one. You're serving one side or the other. And sadly, there are many who claim the name of Christ who are not building the kingdom of God. And by omission, they are furthering the enemies camp here on earth by making Jesus look powerless. The best thing for those who have not yet surrendered to God is a delay in God's judgment on this planet and for the committed Christians who are actually out pursuing the kingdom to be coming around them and leading them to Christ before the end comes, which is soon. So any delay is just a few more days for us to reach a few more people keep a few more from hell for eternity. John 9 31 declares, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. It has also been said that the only prayer that God hears from a sinner is a prayer for salvation. As a result, some believe that God does not hear or will not answer the prayers of an un unbeliever. In context though, John 9 31 is saying God does not perform miracles through an unbeliever, but 1 John 5, 14 and 15 tells us that God answers prayers based on whether they are asked according to his will. So if an unbeliever asks a prayer of God that is according to his will, there's nothing preventing God from answering that prayer. So it isn't just a flat statement that God will not answer the prayers of unbelievers because he can and he will if they are according to his will. 
There are clear Bible reasons for unanswered prayer. God uses unanswered prayers to make us more like Christ and to build spiritual growth. Sometimes we get very discouraged when he doesn't answer right away and we keep knocking, but he knows what's best. Never lose hope and always seek his will and not your own. But here are some possible reasons that your prayers have not been answered, if you are a follower of Jesus. One, it's not God's will. We must always seek God's will. It's all about him and the advancement of his kingdom, not us. 1 John 5, 14 through 15, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. Matthew 6, says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Number two, wrong motives and ungodly prayers. James 4, 3, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Proverbs 16, 2, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Proverbs 21, 2, a person may think their own ways are right, but the Lord weighs the heart. This happens a lot with relationships. When people are seeking especially a companion in dating, they, they settle for something that the, the flesh wants and then they twist it to everyone saying that they're bringing this person to a closer relationship with Jesus, which is a lie for one. The one that's already winning on that mission field is the unbeliever, because they've already gotten a believer to submit to that relationship. So they're already, they've got the upper hand already. It's a tragic choice that takes many, many people out of the kingdom. They can't let go. They just can't let go. The euphoria that comes over them in the relationship is worth losing Jesus. Happens all the time. Three, unconfessed sin. Psalm 66, 18. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Isaiah 59, 2. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Four, rebellion. Living a continuous life of sin. Proverbs 28, 9. If anyone turns a deaf ear to my instruction, even their prayers are detestable. John 9, 31, we know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. 1 Peter 3, 12, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the Lord turns his face against those who do evil. 5, closing your ears to the needy. Proverbs 21, 13, whoever shuts their ears to the cry of the poor will also cry out and not be answered. Six, you're not having a fellowship with the Lord. Your prayer life is non-existent and you never spend time in the word. John 15, 7 says, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, what, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Seven, the Lord could be protecting you from danger that you do not see coming. That has happened to me way too many times. Psalm 121, 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. Psalm 91, 10, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent. 8, doubting. James 1, 6 says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. Matthew 21, 22, you can pray for anything, and if you have faith, you will receive it. Of course, that's from a believer praying in God's will. Mark 11, 24, therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Those last two verses are probably two of the most twisted verses by those seeking prosperity of any kind. They twist words like that. Those are verses that are, that are used frequently to test God. The sad thing is no one's fooled by that. The world sees that. They call it all the time. It's sadly just Christians that fall for that because the world does not fall for that. 
they're wiser in that sense. They can see the manipulation and the, they just see the manipulation. Number nine, God didn't answer so you can grow in humility. James 4.10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. First Peter 5.6, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. 10, God didn't answer because of your pride. Proverbs 29.23, one's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. James 4, 6, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. 11, hypocritical praying for attention. Matthew 6, 5, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. 12, giving up. Just when you give up, that is when God answers. You must persevere. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 through 18, pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Galatians 6, 9, let us not become weary in doing good for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Luke 18, 1, then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. 13, lack of faith. Hebrews 11.6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please God, because everyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. 14. You won't forgive others. Mark 11.25-26 And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Matthew 6.14 for if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. 15. Sometimes when God says no or not yet, it's to bring greater glory to himself. 1 Corinthians 10.31 So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. 16. God is making you rely and trust in him more. Proverbs 3.5-6 Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him, and he will make your path straight. 17, our awesome God is in control, and he has something better for you. Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can all ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. Romans 8.28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. That's really hard to get your head around when you've had a lot of trauma and things happen, but everything that God uses in my life is the trauma and his healing of it. So all of the bad things are now working for me and for many others. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not harm you, plans to give you a hope in a future. 18, you didn't ask. James 4, 2 says you desire but do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight, you do not have because you do not ask God. 19, treating your spouse or your family badly. 1 Peter 3, 7 says, Likewise, husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I am dumbfounded at the number of wives that are being, some battered, but some just emotionally, and they're just being emotionally just, destroyed by, it, it, it happens both ways, I want to say both men and women, but inside of the family unit, these kinds of things are going on. And how many times I hear that they have asked for help and they were told, even in cases where there was violence, they were told they need to forgive and they need to submit, and they need to help heal the marriage. That is completely against what God says of husbands and wives. Wives are to honor, or to respect. Husbands are to honor and cherish. 
There is nothing in the Bible that allows for that person being abused to not abandon that marriage. I'm not saying there has to be a divorce, but they certainly have the freedom to leave and should. 20, not yet, God says. We must wait for his timing. Isaiah 55, 8, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. 21, fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power of love and a sound mind. 22, negative confession. Matthew 17, 20, and Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, remove yourself to a yonder place and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. 23, laziness. 2 Thessalonians 3.10, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. M most of those that I see that are not serving in the kingdom, that should be, that's the reason, laziness. This country has created a culture that actually supports and honors laziness. It makes it possible to live your whole life without having to work. It's completely against kingdom and it destroys humans. That is one of the greatest things. Sloth and laziness does more damage to the kingdom almost than any addiction. It is an addiction. 24, hindering spirits. Daniel 10, 12 says, then he said to me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you did set your heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, your words were heard and I came. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one, 21 days and Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. So in Daniel's case, his answer to prayer got held up by the demonic. 25, in gratitude. Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. There's nothing about ungrateful people that makes you want to do one more thing for them. 26, self-pity. Deuteronomy 28, 13, and the Lord should make you the head and not the tail, and you will be above only and not beneath. And when people submit to being beneath it's really pointless to even answer any other prayers because it just gets submitted to the wrong side. Suppose God does not answer your prayers to stop your spouse from leaving you. But if you consider yourself too moral to kidnap them and keep them prisoner in your house forever, you wouldn't do that to keep them. You have that option where you could tie them up in your house and keep them. But you wouldn't do that because you're too good of a person to do that. But yet you expect God to do that. You want God to tie them to you as a prisoner. If they will only stay if they're forced, why would you be satisfied with that spouse who stayed only because they were conned, drugged, hypnotized, tied up? Why would you want that? Why would you want God to get them to stay when he would even have to use manipulation and underhanded tactics to make that happen, force their will? He doesn't do that. So praying to God to force his will or your will through him on someone else violates the very thing that sets us apart, and that is free will. What if you were the one trying to flee the relationship and couldn't because your spouse was praying prayers that kept you tied to them, that were being heard and God was answering them and you were stuck. A God of love wants people to love and love cannot be forced or manipulated if it's genuine. Something that is forced or conned is not real love. There are things that not even an omnipotent God can do. He will not override the will. He will not make an immoral act moral. For God to even force salvation on someone would be an act of cruelty on his part 
overpowering someone's will and making them do something they aren't wanting to do. God has impeccable integrity and he will resort to nothing underhanded, even to spare his own pain and broken heart. We know God will exercise his incredible patience by delaying judgment on sinners, but his will is that more would be saved. That is why. 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18 says, For our light affliction, which is for the moment, works for us more and more exceedingly an eternal weight of glory, while we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Philippians 1, 21 through 25 says, For to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. But if I live on, on, in, on in the flesh, this will bring fruit from my work. Yet I don't know what I will choose, but I'm in a dilemma between the two, having the desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, yet to remain in the flesh is more needful for your sake. Having this confidence, I know that I will remain, yes, and remain with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. We desperately need to involve God in absolutely every aspect of our lives. If we try to treat God as a vending machine, an emergency kit, a fire insurance policy from hell, a status symbol, some kind of spiritual fashion statement, we not only offend and depersonalize God, we damage and depersonalize ourselves. And there's nothing more appalling than to turn from the true God to worship a false God or to turn the true God into a false God by the way we think of him and by the way we treat him. It's just as terrible to worship a false God that we have created in our imagination and fraudulently call it the God of the Bible and to worship a false God another religion has already made. Calling your own making of the God of the Bible it's not just dishonest, it's deceitful. Instead of honoring and seeking to please and serve the real God, we have, many have replaced him in our minds with a caricature that is not even a shadow of who he really is. Do we exalt the most beautiful, lovable, tender-hearted, and glorious one in the universe, or do we defile him in our hearts by seeing him as a mere sugar daddy for all that we can get from him? Sadly, many in the church do exactly that. God is highly personal. <clears throat> he has passions and feelings so deep that alongside him, we all appear very hard and very cold. He's the most beautiful and sensitive one in all the universe. If we're so callous as to try to use God for our selfish purposes, rather than as someone to please and delight in, we are not fit for shallow human friendships, let alone anything more meaningful. When in submission to God, faith-filled prayer can achieve amazing things. Faith that our perfect Lord will respond to our request in a perfect way is never misdirected. Throughout your life, how devoted have you been to seeking deep intimacy with God and hearing from Him and obeying Him, especially in the details? He alone knows what is best and what is in our best interest and rarely does that match anything that's easy for us. Too often things turn sour. We blame God for what is simply the result of our willfulness, our own choices, us being content to do things our way rather than seeking God's way. We brought it all on ourselves. Are you God's servant or do you treat him as your servant? How much have you died to self and let Christ rule in your thought life and your circumstances? How much do you seek to glorify God in your daydreams and in your fantasies, in your choice of music, in what you read, in your television viewing, your internet usage, your social media, your conversations and where your eyes wander? I used to work with a chaplain in the jails and he would say, I can eavesdrop on you for five minutes and tell you what kind of a Christian you are. He would also say, if you're not eagerly waiting for Jesus Christ to return, he's not coming for you. 
these things end up powerfully influencing and shaping our self-image, everything that we pour into our lives, our likes, dislikes, our relationships. How much are we cultivating the fruit of the Spirit? Selfless love, rejoicing in all circumstances, being peaceable, patient, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Each of these is critical to healthy, fulfilling relationships and being a follower of Jesus and advancing his kingdom. Either God is first in our lives, he's first in our affections, or he is not our God. Precious Lord, please help us. There are so many in a delusion, and some of us, this is something to constantly do inventory on. You are worthy of our worship. You are the only one that has paid a price to receive any worship from us. No other God has given his life for us. No other God is raised and living and interceding for us right now. You are worthy of our worship. I ask that you convict all of us of any attempts to manipulate you, of our attempts to use you to advance anything in our lives, whether it be a reputation, a ministry in any way. Help us, Jesus, to never use you, to not use you for any reason, to make money, gain money, get money. Help us never to monetize you, to cheapen you into something to gain money. Please help us at this time in history to care more about our family around us, our friends around us, our neighbors around us who do not know Jesus, who are about to crash into eternity and never have another chance. Help us to love people enough to stop seeking pleasure, to stop being comfortable, to stop just having an easy life focused on our own concerns. Convict us, God, of the people we love, the people that are in our own families that do not know you. I pray that you help us have holy boldness for this time in history that no one who claims the name of Jesus Christ would continue to live selfishly, self-centered, and thinking that somehow that's going to be acceptable at the end. By the power of your Holy Spirit, I ask that you just sweep through us and cut out all the trash that's in us that keeps us from hearing you, seeing you, and loving others, and loving you the way that you are. Help us, Jesus. I ask this in your precious name. Amen.